Good morning. <laughs> I'm Minister David Roundtree, and I have the privilege this morning of sharing the Word of God. And for a topic this morning, we'll be talking about a friendship that's worth finding. Friendship worth finding. And so, as a scripture text, we'll be using Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. Proverbs 18, 24, which reads like this. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. And so we'll be talking about briefly um, this morning, friendship worth finding. Most of us can remember the Wizard of Oz. We can remember Dorothy falling asleep and having a dream that she wasn't in Kansas anymore. We can remember that in the dream, the way to get back was to get the wisdom from a man in the land of Oz known as the Wizard of Oz. And throughout all of her adversity, all of her ups and downs to get to Oz, to get to this wizard, she finally gets there, only to see a curtain being moved in the periphery of her, vi her, of her vision. And as a result, little Toto, her dog, runs over and exposes that the wizard was only a man. So imagine her disappointment. She needed the wisdom to get back home, but she couldn't get the wisdom to get back home because the wizard was just a man. And that's where we are right now. In our world, in our country, there are people who are seeking wisdom, but the wisdom is readily available for those of us who know where to look and knowing where that wisdom comes from. That's what the book of Proverbs is about. So the book of Proverbs simply means, in, in fact, the term simply means likeness or comparison. It's just a likeness or comparison. They are a book, it's not a fluid book where you read uh, from Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, from, from uh, Proverbs 1 through 31. So it's not a fluid book with fluid ideas and concepts, but it is a book of probabilities. In other words, uh, it is a book that teaches us that if we fear the Lord, obey him, things will likely go well for us. And many dis are disappointed because it also teaches that where there is no fear of the Lord, the Bible equates that to foolishness and things will likely not go well for you, right? So if you can think of how sometimes we're let down or we think we're let down by the word of God, for example, the scripture that says, train up a child in the way, in the way he should go. <laughs> and when he is old, he won't depart from that. So we think about that and we raise our children in the church and we give them the word of God. And when they leave our homes, they have a, a solid foundation of the word of God only to get to the college campus and be taught by an atheistic professor and begin to question everything that we have taught them, everything that's on their base. And some of us lose hope at that particular time because we don't see the big picture. The big picture is God giving us a probability saying that things will likely go well for you and the hope is that it ain't over yet, right? So if we train up a child in the way he should go according to the scriptures and we trust God, we obey him, then things are likely to go well for us. That's what this book teaches us, right? So by way of background, the book of Proverbs is a result of basically the, the work of Solomon. And we know the story of Solomon, and we can find that if we read this, go back in the scriptures, we can find that there was a transition in Israel from David to his son Solomon. So David the king has died and now there's a rough transition and Solomon is coming into power. Solomon says in uh, 1 Kings chapter three, Solomon asked God for something. 
Now notice he didn't ask God for fame, fortune, for wealth. He didn't ask God for any of those things. But what he asked God for was wisdom. Solomon was wise enough even before the wisdom of God to know that he could not rule the people well without the wisdom of God. He could be placed into a position, but without the wisdom of God, he could not rule the people well. So this request pleased God to the point where God granted him his petition. And so in the very next chapter, 1 Kings chapter 4, we see that God gave Solomon wisdom, insight, and understanding. It also says that this wisdom was greater than the wisdom of the people. Goes on to talk about how um, this wisdom actually attracted people from all other countries as well as the, the other fellow Israelites. We also see in Ecclesiastes, another book of, of wisdom, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it talks about where this wisdom came from, right? So this wisdom, as this book points out, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 9 through 11, lets us know that this wisdom was not like any other wisdom that any other person had. This was the wisdom of God, and it came from one shepherd, shepherd with a capital S. That means it came from God himself, right? So this wisdom came from God. So this book, the purpose of the book is to help the reader develop practical skills for living well. And the theme of the book, or the big idea, is about God's wisdom that allows us to live well. Now this term wisdom is actually in the Hebrew, the, and excuse my Hebrew, but the, it, it actually hokmah, hokmah. So this is the wisdom of God, right? So it's not like any other wisdom. This wisdom is much, much, much different. In fact, this is the kind of wisdom that when we pray for our leaders in our country, this is the kind of wisdom that we need to pray that God will bless them with that God will allow them to feel uh, and not only feel but know and understand this same wisdom that Solomon had. In fact, James says that if any man lacks wisdom, he should ask of God. So this wisdom is accessible to us, not only in the book of Proverbs, but also in prayer. So this wisdom is not, this wisdom is, is not like any other wisdom. In fact, to get this wisdom, the book, this book lets us know that we, it starts off with the fear of the Lord. In other words, if you're going to get some wisdom, some really good wisdom, then you have to start at its source. And you can't just start at its source without understanding who the giver of wisdom is. So all good wisdom will ultimately come from the source who is God. But we can't get to that unless we have a healthy respect of God. In other words, God is not our, our he is our friend, but he's not uh, our buddy or our pal. And I'll get to that a little bit later. So we have to understand that in order to get the wisdom of God, or in order to get true wisdom, we've got to go to, to God himself. Because it all starts with the fear, a healthy respect of who God is, what he can do. And the fact that he can, he's the ultimate blesser of, of life itself. So, with that, all of that being said, uh, by way of background, and even a little bit more background. Right? So, when we, look at, when we look at the Proverbs, we find that they're basically three different types. We find that there's a contrastive Proverbs, right? Like Proverbs, like the previous verse, uh, right before our text, which says... And you'll find that words like that, you'll find words like but. And let me find that so I can read that, All right? So it says, Proverbs 18.23 is a contrastive proverb. It says that the poor plead for, for mercy, but the, the rich answer harshly. So we'll find the word but in a contrastive proverb. In a comparative proverb, we can find that in Proverbs 25, verse 11. And we'll see words like, like, or as, like apples of gold in settings of silver, 
is a ruling rightly given. And in our text today, we'll see Proverbs 18.24. We looked at the contrastive, the comparative, and now this is considered a completive where we find the word and. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. I'm sorry, but we see the word and also in a completive text. And then it goes on to say in some texts, but and others, and there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So we'll find a comparative uh, proverb at times also. So when we look at this, they're contrastive, completive, and comparative proverbs. Not just good advice, but godly wisdom. Not just good advice, but godly wisdom. Okay, so I'm trying to get to my, uh, my first gem. And the reason I'm trying to get there is to point out the contrast in the word friend. We see the word friend in our text two times. It talks about unreliable friends, and then it talks about a friend. So the first one is an unreliable friend, a rea. So that person is just an associate. Might be a neighbor, might be a companion, That person is just an associate. And we'll see this person in a crowd of people, all right? So gem number one, don't look for a crowd of true friends, right? So just like celebrities have a whole lot of people who claim to know, really don't. They only have a few close friends and all the rest are just fans or associates. Many times we get disappointed because when we're looking for friends, we look in all the wrong places, right? So we go to places that are crowded. We go to bars, we go to work, we go to church, we go to places where there are big crowds and we look for our friends to be in those places. But let me save you a little bit of disappointment because those people are considered just rayox. Those people are those kinds of friends that we may be able to rely on, but we probably will not be able to rely on. Why? Because a friend is a person who steps in the way on our way down, right? So if we're falling, a friend is that person who will be there at that moment. When we're spiraling out of control, a friend is a person who will be there for us. Secondly, the second friend, the friend who sticks closer than a brother is called an Ahab, an Ahab, and that person is an intimate, affectionate friend, a person who is loved, a person who can be uh, understood and appreciated, a person who will be there for us as we are there for him. That is the uh, the friend who sticks closer than a brother. So true story, I grew up in West Charlotte, place called Smallwood, had just moved from Third Ward, rough area of town, and didn't really have any friends. There were a group of us who would come together, play football, basketball, all of that. But there was a guy named Jerry. I don't know what it is about me and friends. Most of my true friends, close friends, are always six feet or taller. For whatever reason, Jerry kept growing, and I didn't. But we befriended each other, and he became a friend who stuck closer to me and became like family to me. So there were days when I would go home and uh, realize that I could not only go home, I could go to Jerry's house, which was a home also, and sometimes Jerry could come to my house, which was another home. He would get disappointed when he would stick his behind in my father's chair, and my father would say, nope, you got to get up, got to go to another chair. But other than that, Jerry was my brother. I was Jerry's brother. I would go to his house. I would, his mom would fix sandwiches for us, and we always had this joke about those sodas that she would bring home. They were always the name brand sodas, and I don't want to name them, but they were always uh, store brand sodas. Not, they were always the store brand, and they were so strong, we, our joke was, I don't want any of that, or we'd have to mix it with water because it would take the, the, pa- the, uh, the paint off the wall. That's how strong the sodas were. But he was that kind of brother who was like family to me. And I was like family to him. 
And so even after all these years, when we see each other, we greet each other, not as just friends, distant friends, but as brothers. And so this is what the text is saying, that there are two kinds of friends. And don't be disappointed if you find one friend in one place in the crowd, because your friend will likely stand out from the crowd. All right. My second point is to expect to find the second kind of friend, the ahab. Expect to find that person uh, to be able, expect a true friend to be able to speak to you in love. Now, one of the things that true friendship does is that it risks true friendship. Right? So if I see you going down and I see you spiraling out of control, if I'm your true friend, I'm going to step in and I'm going to say something to you. You may not like it. You may not appreciate what I'm doing. And others may not appreciate it either. And I sometimes don't appreciate when a true friend will tell me something when my life is spiraling out of control because my perspective is, is off and my thoughts are distort it. So a true friend will step in when they see you out of control and they will speak to you in love, right? They will stop you. They want to block your downward spiral. So there's a friend who, or those persons who seek friendship in the crowd will, will find unlikely friends and they will come to ruin, but there is one friend who will stick closer than any brother. This person will come to you and step in the way and make you feel like, you know what, I don't appreciate you right now, but I, I'm grateful for you. And I don't know about you, but in my life, the Holy Spirit has done that dozens and dozens and hundreds and thousands of times. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. And he has a way of telling us things that nobody else can tell us. You see, we offend each other. Flesh and blood will offend each other. But the Holy Spirit will have a way of gently speaking to our spirits and saying, now, you know you're wrong. You know you got to get this right. You know you have to do it this way and not that way. And the Holy Spirit has a way of speaking to us in love and correcting us. And we can trust him because he'll never leave us, nor will he ever forsake us. My third point is this. that your true, well, let me back up. I want to tell you who my BFF really is. I love Jerry. I thank God for him, uh, for how he's been there for me all these many years. I'm grateful for that. But I can tell you a story of when I met my true BFF, right? So when I met him, I was a broken man. I didn't have anything going for me. I didn't have money. I had a piece of a job. In fact, it was one of those temp jobs. That's all I had at the time. Didn't have a dime to my name. I was behind on every bill that, that I could think of. My car was almost about to be repossessed. In fact, it was right before it was repossessed because I couldn't make the payments on it. So my life was broken. I didn't have anybody around me. I felt like I had no friends. And so I began to isolate into depression, into my own uh, little world. I would just go to work and come back and, and go and be in my apartment. And so I was actually in Durham, North Carolina, which is where I met my true BFF. I was there. I don't know what was going on in my head and I felt alone. Uh, I was there. And uh, there was a brother who would just keep coming by um, because he was a friend of my roommate, became my friend. Uh, he kept coming by. And he kept coming by wanting to do Bible study. I thought, man, this guy's like, I mean, you know, you, you're crazy. And so he kept coming by and kept coming by and kept coming by. And my MO, my, my modus operandi at the time was to back Christians up. Don't come witnessing to me because I'm a black man and I'm in this world and you don't understand. And so when Christians would come to me who really didn't understand, I would ask them one question and back them up. And that question was, you know what? You're telling me all this, but in my world, I see everything in black and white. 
So I just want to know what color was Jesus. And they would give me all kinds of answers and some gave, I think gave me the correct answers. They would say, well, it really doesn't matter. Well, it mattered to me at the time and there was not one Christian who could articulate the truth of God other than to say it really doesn't matter, right? So I would back them up. Well, what color was Jesus? They couldn't answer. They would go away, I guess, and do their thing. I wouldn't see him again. But this brother kept coming by, and I would ask him, because I wanted to back him up too. I was angry. I was isolated. I was depressed. I wanted him to get away from me. And so when I asked him the question, he gave me an honest answer. He simply said, you know what? I don't really know. And that floored me. And it floored me to the sense that here was an honest man that I could probably trust. And he backed it up with this. I don't really know, but if you like, we could study that and we can see, you know, what color he was, who he actually was. And that impressed me about this young man. And you know what? To this day, I don't know where he is. I don't even remember his name. Could have been an angel. And I just thank God that he actually came into my life and made a difference and changed me. So I thank God for that. And he introduced me not only to himself and his family, but to my new BFF. And that person was Jesus Christ. That person was Jesus Christ. So I'm so grateful for that. And my third point is this. Your true BFF has already died for you, has already been buried, has already been resurrected and ascended. And the fact of the matter is he's coming back again. So your true BFF is, is called a friend to sinners. Now, when they said that, they tried to offend him. This was supposed to be a derogatory term, and it really was not. Because he was my friend, and he still is. You see, in Durham, North Carolina, when it really, my life didn't even make a difference. When I was hopeless, when I was in despair, Jesus came by, and when I was spiraling out of control, he came by and he stopped the downward progress. He stepped in the way, put himself in harm's way, and made a difference in my life. And I can say, as a matter of fact, that yes, he is a friend of sinners, and I'm glad about it. And so what does he model for us today? How, do we, how, how does he model friendship? And what are we to do about it? When we look at our world, our world is in chaos. When we see our country, our country has no direction, has no moral direction, has no true competent leadership. And so we need to know, God, what in the world are you doing? We need to rely on our BFF and follow his examples also. So I want to drop four gems on you, and then we're going to pray, and then I'm going to be out your way. And I wish you a very uh, a blessed uh, day today. Uh, so I want to drop those four gems on you right now. The first thing that we have to do if we're going to model the friendship that Jesus modeled for us is to intentionally, intentionally take time for our friends. What did Jesus do with the woman of the well? Right before that, you remember, he had his motley crew with him, the apostles that were walking with him. He sent them off. And he said, it's necessary that I go through Samaria. He knew that there was a woman at the well that he had to meet there. And he took the time intentionally to meet this woman right where she was, broken, depressed, all by herself, in her solitude. And Jesus stopped by. He intentionally made time for her. And so we need to do the same thing to our friend. Our friends need us in the world today. The people that don't even know us, they need true friends. And we need to be those friends. This world is dark. And God has called us to be a light in darkness. So the darker the world gets, the brighter we shine. God has called us to be intentional about making friends. Now understand that this friend was not like Jesus. She didn't have the gender of Jesus, and she was not of his ethnicity. She was a Samaritan, right? So Jesus took the time to intentionally befriend a person who didn't look like him and who was not like him. He took the time to befriend this woman. When we look at also going back and looking at this relationship or lack of a relationship between the Jews and the Samaritans, we can see the story of the Good Samaritan. 
and how the priests, the preachers, the Levites, all of those saw a wounded man on the side of the road and left him there. But it was the Samaritan who crossed over on the other side of the road, risked his life. There could have been others who were waiting for him to sabotage him, risked his life, and, and, and put the man on his beast, took the man to a, a hotel, and, and paid for his hotel stay until he recovered. The Samaritans. We need to understand that we don't live in a world of Jews, necessarily Jews and Samaritans, but there's a division in this country. There's a division in this world, and we need to learn how to cross over to the other side, intentionally making time for our friends. We've got to be friends. We can't be like the, the original uh, friends in the, in the text, but we've got to be the latter. We've got to model the friendship that Jesus gave to us. My second point is this. Be there for your friend the way you want your friend to be there for you, right? So if we're going to be like Jesus, we've got to be there when it's inconvenient for us, right? So when God shows up, it's not always a convenient time for us. And sometimes he'll invade our space and he'll let us know that I'm right here. I'm right here. You're not alone. So I want you to know that I'm right here for you. Guess what we have to do? If we're going to model true friendship, we got to invade somebody's space and let them know, brother, sister, I'm right here for you. My third point is this. I'm trying to get out your way. Study and know your friend. Don't just assume certain things about your friend. So there's this thing in my profession, and probably you've heard of it, called cultural competence, right? So some people say, well, I'm culturally competent because I took a Spanish class, so I know Spanish people. Don't know the culture. Don't know if you're, is it, are you Mexican? Are you Puerto Rican? Are you Dominican? Don't know the culture whatsoever. Don't know the dialect. Only thing they know is that they, they took a Spanish class and they assume that they are culturally competent. But there's another thing called cultural humility. That means a person who is a lifelong student of a, that culture. So, now that I found out that you're Hispanic, now I need to know what type of Hispanic you are. And then I need to know what type of, of culture you're in. And then I need to know what type of family you have. And then I need to know how you operate from one system to the next. That's called culturally, being culturally humble. And it's the same concept that we have even between man and wife, right? So 26 years next week, my wife and I will be, will be married. 26 years. 26 years. She, she's put up with me, right, for 26 years. And we're still studying each other. We, can't, we can say that we know each other, but we're still studying each other. Still studying how our moods uh, will, will affect the other. Still studying who we are when we come home. Still studying what, what has she been through at work. What, what has he been through at work? And we can't just assume certain things about each other. We have to uh, study and then know each other. Guess what we have to do to our friends? Guess what Jesus did? He studied us. He knows us. Not only did he just study us, but he made us. He created us. He knows from the tip of our heads to the tip, tips of our feet. He knows every detail about us. He studies and he knows us. And he, because he knows us, he can speak to a Zacchaeus in a tree that when the crowd is, is around him, and he can, even when the crowd is against Zacchaeus, Jesus can come in the midst of a crowd and call out his name. He studied and he knew not only Zacchaeus, but his situation. He, can, he studied and he knew Lazarus. So Lazarus, Jesus already knew he's dying now. He's in the process of dying. He told his disciples, let's go uh, and, and see Lazarus. And then the disciples didn't get it. Uh, Jesus said, you know, he's, he's sleeping. Disciples didn't get it, and Jesus said, let me just tell y'all guys, because y'all kind of, you know, dull. He told them, he said, look, Lazarus is dead. And then he went on to say, and I am glad, right, for your sakes that he died. And so 
what he's saying is, I studied Lazarus and I know Lazarus. He's not dead just yet, but now at this particular time, he's dead. Now let's go see Lazarus. Jesus studied and knew his friends. He knows our situation. He knows when we're up and he knows when we're down. He knows when we need him. He knows that right now we need him. He knows that we're a divided nation and right now he needs him. We need him. Guess who's going to show up in our situation? Our hope and our faith is for God to show up right here and right now. And he will because he studies us and he knows us. Now, what do we have to do to model that? We've got to study and know our friends, right? We, so it's not just our buddies, not just everybody who looks like us. It's not just the people we live beside, but sometimes it's the people that we are exact opposite from, that God is calling you to go and be a friend of that person. Now go and study and know that person and step into their lives because they could be on a downward spiral. My last point is this. Ask your friend's permission to be honest. If granted permission, speak truth in love. Ask his permission first, or her permission first, to be honest. Because sometimes we feel like, oh, because I've got truth, I'm going to bang you over the head with truth. No, but that's not, it's not about that. It's about truth in love. <clears throat> Gracious truth, right? So if you ask that person's permission after you study and know this person, now you can go and say, look, um, I see that you've done this or that. How can I help you? Or do you mind if I point out a few things? If they say no at the time, let it go. If they say, okay, go ahead, let me have it. Then you can actually talk to them about their situation and about the observations that you're making. Otherwise, it's just you barging in on them, unlike what God would do for us. So sometimes God measures us, and he knows when he has to do whatever he has to do with us. But most of the time, the Holy Spirit is a gentleman, yeah. right? So he won't kick in your door and fire bullets. What he'll do is knock on the door and ask your permission, are you ready to receive me right now? And some people are not ready. What other people do is, is simply say, well, nope, I'm not ready, I'm not ready, I'm not ready. And they're, st they're not at the point where they can receive anything from the Lord. So don't be disappointed when you go up to a person and ask their permission to minister the word of God and they tell you no. It's not your timing, it's not your word, it's not your salvation. This thing is all on God. All you are, all, all you need to remember is Apollo's planet, I watered, but it's God who gives the increase, right? So if God tells you to do something and they don't receive it, shake the dust from your feet and keep on moving. And thank God that he privileged you with the opportunity to share. He gave you another opportunity and he chose you as a tool, as a chosen vessel to use you at that moment and that time. It's not about how people receive it. It's about you being available to whatever God tells you to do. So ask for your friend's permission and be honest. Ask for your friend's permission and be honest. If granted permission, speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. I'm going to be honest. I want to close right there, but I don't want to close right there. One thing about friendship is that we have to have trust and truth. And in friendship, trust and truth are not negotiable. We can't negotiate on that. If you don't allow me to, if you allow me to speak the truth, I can't negotiate on giving you a half truth. I have to give it to you. Or if I allow you to speak truth to me, I have to be ready to receive whatever you give to me. And I have to be honest with you. I've dealt with a lot recently. So I've dealt with the, the loss of a, a loved one, uh, a relative. I've also dealt with the loss of my mentor, right? Dr. Nicholas Cooper-Luder. I miss him already. Just lost another loved one uh, yesterday, day before. Um, I say loved one, I mean relative. So I lost another one, right? So in the midst of all this pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic, there's a foolishness that we have to deal with as a country that we've kicked that can down the road so long. And now we have to deal with it again because we didn't handle it properly before. 
And I understand that God will give us test after test after test, and if we don't pass them, we gotta keep taking the test over and over and over again. And I wanna speak a word right now to my brothers and sisters who might be hurting. I wanna speak a word honestly to you black men who might, may think that I'm on the outside and I'm looking in and nobody understands me. I'm all by myself. All I wanna do is go to work and come home. I know what it's like. Yeah. I can honestly tell you, I know what it's like to pull out your driveway and don't even go a block and get stopped. Not only get stopped, but get searched and checked. Hands on the hood of your car in front of your neighbors truck open, your whole car search. What are you looking for, sir? I don't know. We just heard this, we just heard that. I know what it's like to go for a run and have cars circling, police cars circling up and down the street around you. I understand, I got it, I know what it's like. I have not forgotten. I'm grateful for the privilege to, to preach and teach the word of God. I am so grateful for this, this opportunity and for any opportunities that the Lord would allow, but I've not forgotten. I'm grateful for the privilege that God has given me in the past to go back to it. Grateful for a, a bachelor's degree, grateful for a master's degree, grateful for all of that. Grateful for certifications in, in multiple states. I'm so grateful to God for all of that. But with all of that, I have not forgotten. I know what it's like to walk in a store and have money in your pocket and to go purchase a thing, to walk around the store and have people follow you. I got it. But there's another thing I got, and that is hope. And when I look at our people in our cities, these are people who feel like nobody's hearing me, and this is the only way I can get attention, which is to tear down communities. I understand this too, that that is a peripheral issue. That's not the main issue. And I understand what the main issue is, and if we can just speak plain, it's police brutality. We've got, and it's inequity, and not only law enforcement, but in other areas as well. If there's one thing that the COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, exposed, it's the inequity in our medical field. And so now African Americans and Hispanics are more affected by that because when they go to get the test, they're told you're okay, go home, and they go home and die. It exposed all of that. So I'm grateful, I'm grateful to be in this day and in this time. And although I'm very uncomfortable about the things that I say, I have to say what I believe the Lord has placed on my heart. So if you take offense, I still say it unapologetically, and I say it because I, I want to speak the truth, and I want to speak it in love. I want to let all of our hurting brothers and sisters know that God has a plan for your life, that it ain't over till it's over, that you don't have to be without hope, you don't have to be in despair, God has something for you, and you don't have to feel like you're the invisible man anymore. That is until you walk down a sidewalk and then other folk go to the other side. You don't have to feel like that anymore. You don't have to feel like nobody's hearing you. You've got an advocate, not only with people, but you've got an advocate with God the Father. And I know this is not a comfortable hour, it's not a comfortable moment, and it's not a comfortable word, but what I do understand is that God is still our advocate and he sees what's going on. And so my prayer is that every black man who is listening to me, every white man, every, every man, and I do say this without apology, black lives do matter. Black lives do matter. So you can throw off and say all lives matter. Of course they do. Nobody's denying that. But what we have to point out is the inequity in these different systems that are around us. And so we, I would be remiss, I'd be lying to you if I just came and, and gave you one, two, three points, four points, and just sat, it, sat down. I think God is doing something in this day and time. In fact, I'll have to say that I know God is doing something right here and right now. And so I want you 
to lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. I don't want you to give up hope. I want you to have faith over and over and over again. Even when it's inconvenient, keep your faith in God. And so, with all that being said, and whether you're offended or not, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father and our God, we thank you right now. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you, Father God, for just being who you are. And we thank you, Father God, that you are a God. You speak a word to us when we need to hear it. And so, God, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you for the privilege. Even though I'd rather not speak this word, I'd rather, Father God, just do a, a sermon, a Bible study, and sit down. But for whatever reason, Father, um, you allowed me to, to do this today. And so, Lord, I thank you for the privilege. I thank you for being alive. I thank you for life. And Father God, we're living in a day and a time in which we don't even know if we're going to be able to drive home and make it there alive. So Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you will just station angels all around about us. That even when people look at our color and that's a weapon to them and they respond to what they see as a weapon, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would disarm them, not only from bullets that might kill the body, but I pray, God, that you would disarm all of the harsh words. I pray, Father God, that the friend that we talked about who sticks closer than a brother will show up. And I pray, God, against racism. I pray against that, Father. I pray that our white brothers and sisters will understand it's not about red or blue or Democrat or Republican because those people and those systems can't help us. And that's why we appeal to you. And so, Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will be that friend who steps in harm's way. So for those persons who feel like they have no hope, they don't even care. They're just out there doing whatever they have to do, and they have to do whatever the crowd or the movement of the crowd is at the time. I pray for conviction in the name of Jesus. But Father, I pray for the root cause. The root cause is evil. Evil has been conveyed in this country as good for so long, but I pray against it right now in the name of Jesus. I pray, Father God, that you will just touch right now every hurting man, woman, boy, and girl. And I pray, God, that you will anoint us, that you will strengthen us, that you will let us know that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. I pray, Father God, in Jesus' name, that you will help us to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, with being inconvenienced for the time. I pray, Father God, in Jesus' name, for life. And I speak life right now. And I say that we shall not die, but we shall live and declare the works of the Lord. So thank you. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you for being obedient. I pray right now for our pastor, who is a black male, an African-American male. Father, the world doesn't care that he's got a doctorate degree. The world doesn't care that he's the head over a successful ministry, a growing ministry, an anointed ministry. The world doesn't care. Evil simply wants to destroy him. And so, Father, in your authority, we bind the hand of the enemy, even now in the name of Jesus. And we thank you right now for true victory in you. We pray, Father God, that you would give him strength to lead us 
to speak to us. We pray right now in Jesus' name that you will build him up. Because God, if you'll build him up, we know that as we sit under his teaching and his preaching, that we'll be built up in the process. And God, we thank you right now for every man covered under this ministry, that they realize just that, that they are covered, covered in the blood of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, that you will build us up because vengeance isn't yours, that you'll give us strength, that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but you've given us a spirit of power, of love, and of sound mind. So, Father, to help us, please, Father, to operate in power, in love, and with a sound mind. Help us to think before we do. Help us to spend time with you. And help us to know what a wonderful friend that we have in you. Thank you for accepting us as your friend. We do love you and appreciate everything that you're doing. And thank you for the reminder that you've not forgotten about us. You didn't leave us here and didn't bring us this far to leave us. But, Father, we've got a ways to go. So we thank you for the reminder that this world is not our home. <laughs> we thank you for the reminder, God, that the American dream is not really a dream at all. To some, it's a major nightmare. But we thank you, Father God, that weeping may endure for a night but joy comes in the morning. And so, Father, we hold on to that joy, just as Jesus did, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame. In Jesus' name.